Imagine creatures so powerful, so mysterious, that they've captured our imaginations for centuries. From beasts with bone-crushing jaws to cats with deadly saber teeth, these ancient predators were the true titans of their time. Hold on tight, because what you're about to discover will blow your mind. How could a bear be the size of a dinosaur? It sounds impossible, doesn't it? But it's true. Octotherium angustidens, or the beast bear, was as large as the Allosaurus. And with that insane size, it was one of the most ferocious land predators to ever exist. In fact, it's now debated if it should be crowned the true king of all land predators. So, stay tuned as we dive into the extraordinary life of this ancient beast. Starting with its appearance, Octotherium probably looked a lot like today's spectacle bear. It had a big body, a somewhat short snout, and round ears. But the short snout might just look that way because its face was deep, not because it was actually short. These bears had medium-sized jaws and teeth, suggesting they ate both meat and plants. That's different from herbivorous bears, which have short jaws and big cheek teeth, and carnivorous bears, which have the opposite. Now, Octotherium angustidens is one of the five Octotherium species. Four of the five species were similar in size to modern-day bears, weighing up to 880 pounds, or 400 kilograms. However, the giant short-faced bear, Octotherium angustidens, is the largest documented bear ever. One fossil suggested it could weigh up to 4,500 pounds, or 2,040 kilograms, standing up to 14 feet, or 4.2 meters tall, on its hind legs. That means it was taller than both an average T-Rex and an African bush elephant when it stood upright. In a comparison of its weight, the largest polar bear ever recorded weighed about 2,200 pounds, or 997 kilograms. Another shocking fact about these bears is that their arms were three times longer than a human's. That said, its scientific name, Octotherium, means bear beast in Greek, perfectly describing its enormous size. But how did it grow so big? Well, the source behind Octotherium's gigantism is believed to be the extinction of Chapel Melania, which was a highly specialized omnivore with a diet similar to modern bears. With Chapel Melania gone, intense competition for resources may have eased, allowing Octotherium to rapidly increase in size. This allowed it to become the largest predator during the early Pliocene and early Pleistocene periods. Now, scientists haven't extensively studied this bear's behavior, but it's believed to have behaved similarly to modern bears, so it likely lived solitarily except during breeding seasons and preferred caves or dens as habitats, possibly hibernating in winters in certain regions. Mothers gave birth to a few cubs after a gestation period lasting approximately six to nine months, and communication among these bears likely involved grunts, chuffing, and snorting. You'll be surprised to know that despite its massive size, Octotherium angustidens was pretty efficient in catching prey, thanks to its proportionally long legs that made it possible for it to reach crazy high speeds. It could potentially cross 40 meters or 60 kilometers per hour, similar to a grizzly bear, despite being significantly heavier. Apart from that, it had a strong sense of smell as indicated by the structure of its skull. It is believed that it could detect scents over multiple miles or kilometers, which was pretty handy when it needed to locate and catch prey. Octotherium was found primarily in Argentina, with possible occurrences in El Salvador and Bolivia. Specimens indicate that this giant bear preferred open plains, but also ventured into forested areas. Rare finds also suggest that Octotherium occasionally inhabited paleo burrows, where multiple bodies have been discovered. But one thing is clear, while Octotherium certainly had a love for burrows, it likely didn't create them. Instead, it is believed to have conquered burrows dug by various other animals. These played a significant role in the bear's life, serving as shelter and, potentially, a source of conflict. Competition for burrows among individuals was pretty common, leading to battles and takeovers. And this intense competition likely contributed to an increase in the number of paleo burrows during the early Paleocene, as Octotherium forced other animals to regularly evacuate or face potential conflict. So, being the big bully it was, what did it prey on? Well, these bears had an omnivorous diet, though the specific foods varied among species. The giant short-faced bear ate plant matter, but primarily preyed on large animals like giant ground sloths, camels, tapirs, ancient relatives of elephants, and glyptodonts, or giant armadillos. 
Fossil evidence of broken teeth suggests it also gnawed on bones, possibly as a scavenger rather than an active hunter, due to competition with agile predators like saber-toothed cats. Its size and strength allowed it to intimidate and even chase away these competitors from kills. The other four octotherium species probably leaned more towards fruit and leaves than meat, spending much of their time foraging for vegetation. Competition with predators may have led to their shift towards a more herbivorous diet over time. But who could possibly dare to threaten this beast? Adult Arctotherium likely faced few consistent predators due to its massive size and ferocity. But injuries on fossils suggest it likely fought with other big animals often. The only predator big enough to rival it back then would have been a Smilodon populator. But its cubs may have been at risk from other big cats and birds of prey. Now let's look into some of the most similar animals to this bear. Arctotherium belongs to a group of bears called the Tremarctinae, known for their short faces. While we'll dive into its family tree in more detail later in this video, for now you should know that the other main bear groups are the pandas, Iluropodinae, and modern bears, Yersinae, which include grizzly and black bears. Within the Tremarctinae, there are three major groups. The first one is the spectacled bear, Tremarctos, this is the only surviving member of the short-faced bears. The Florida short-faced bear, another member of this group, went extinct around 11,000 years ago. Spectacled bears are characterized by their short snouts, black bodies, and distinctive white and ginger markings. They are considered vulnerable and are found along the Andean mountain range. The second one is Octodus. This was the North American equivalent of Octotherium, a massive short-faced bear weighing up to 2,100 pounds and standing up to 10 feet tall on its hind legs. They primarily preyed on large animals like deer and mammoths, but likely also ate plants. Arctodus may have been more of a scavenger than an active predator, and the third bear group is known as Pleonoctus. Now this is the oldest member of the short-faced bears, dating back 10 million to 3 million years ago. It is possibly an ancestor of other short-faced bears, but little is known about it. Pleonoctus was likely similar in size to the spectacled bear, now that you know which animals it shares the most similarities with, let's roll the clock all the way back to when this bear was first discovered. The first fossil from the Arctotherium genus was discovered way back in 1852, but it wasn't until 1880 that the genus was officially named by the German-Argentine zoologist Hermann Burmeister after fossils from A. Augustidans were found. Since then, many fossils from this genus have been uncovered, in 1935, during the construction of the San Juan de Dios Hospital in La Plata City near Buenos Aires, Argentina, a pair of arm bones and shoulder blades from the giant short-faced bear were found. It wasn't until 2011 that these bones were thoroughly studied for the first time. Dating back a million years, they belonged to the largest bear ever found, as mentioned earlier. Since only the arm bones were found, scientists had to estimate the bear's total size. Interestingly, despite the attention given to the giant short-faced bear, fossils from A. wingai and A. torrigensa are much more common. This might suggest that they were the most successful species in the Arctotherium genus. Let's look into their family and evolution some more. Arctotherium belongs to the Tremarctinae subfamily of bears, also known as short-faced bears, which also includes Arctodus, North American short-faced bears, and Tremarctus, the Floridian and modern spectacled bear. The common ancestor of these bears is Pleonoctus, dating back to around 10 million years ago in North America. Around 5 million years ago, there was a significant increase in diversity among Tremarctans and other bears due to changes in vegetation, climate, and fauna. Arctotherium, Arctodus, and Tremarctus likely diverged around 4.8 million years ago. The earliest confirmed remains of Arctotherium in South America are from A. Augustidans, found in Buenos Aires, Argentina dating between 1 to 0.7 million years ago during the Encenadan period. A. Augustidans became extinct around 700,000 years ago and was replaced by smaller species. Successor species like A. vetustum, A. beneriensa, A. targensa, and A. wingae appeared during the middle to late Pleistocene, with A. wingae being the smallest but most widespread species. Within Arctotherium, two clades are identified, A. beneriensa and A. targensa, a. Veneriensa and A. Targensa are considered more derived, while A. Vetustum and A. Wingae are considered more primitive, but they are also the most successful in terms of temporal and geographic range and the frequency of fossil finds. Finally, as to what wiped these giant short-faced bears off the planet, 
they likely disappeared between 500,000 to 800,000 years ago. This could be because it had to compete with other top predators like jaguars, cougars, and wolves. Other species of Octotherium might have survived until about 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. The last sightings of Octotherium include one in Uruguay, about 36,900 or 14,485 years ago, another in Chile, around 10,345 years ago, and one in Mexico, approximately 12,850 years ago, with a possible sighting in Venezuela about 9,000 years ago. Interestingly, some Octotherium remains were found alongside human remains in Mexico. The spectacled bear, Tromarctus, doesn't show up in South America's fossil records until much later, suggesting it came from North America after Octotherium went extinct. It's possible that as modern spectacled bears moved southward, they might have mixed with Octotherium. During a period called the Quaternary Extinction Event, species with simpler body shapes, like the Tromarctus bear, were more likely to survive. In the end, Octotherium augustidens, the giant short-faced bear, was the largest land predator of its era. With speeds matching grizzly bears despite its larger size, it was a formidable hunter that even the big cats of its habitat feared. No? Ghost? No. No. Disclaimer, this is not a Game of Thrones fan fiction episode. Dire wolves were real. A hundred thousand years ago, the world was full of creatures we will never see again. And among them was one of North America's coolest ancient predators, the dire wolf. It popped up mysteriously and vanished alongside mammoths and saber-toothed cats at the end of the last ice age people used to think that these guys were close cousins of grey wolves, but the first ever analysis of dire wolf DNA tells a different tale. They're so unique, standing out from other wolves, coyotes and dogs, that they don't quite fit in the same category. In fact, according to researchers, it's time for a new scientific classification, just for these mysterious creatures. Now archaeologists have a good grip on the fact that dire wolves roamed North America from about 250,000 to 13,000 years ago. These badass creatures were around 20% larger than today's grey wolves, and you could often tell by the size of their skeletons. Like typical wolves, they likely roamed in packs, going after bison, ancient horses, and maybe even small mammoths and mastodons. A lot of them met their fate in the sticky asphalt of what we now know as the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, where they got trapped and preserved for all time. If you visit the La Brea Tar Pits Museum in California, you'll find hundreds of dire wolf skulls lining the walls. But here's the problem, our knowledge hits a dead end there. Because dire wolf skeletons resemble those of grey wolves, everyone thought these two were closely related. Scientists have been calling them Canis dirus, tossing them into the same genus as grey wolves, coyotes, and dogs. But the only thing that could have settled the debate, dire wolf DNA, got wrecked by the tar in those pits. In a recent study, researchers went on a bit of a genetic treasure hunt across North America, digging into dire wolf remains at universities and museums. They managed to snatch up about one quarter of the nuclear genome and the full mitochondrial DNA from five different individuals, aged between 13,000 to over 50,000 years old. The genetic material revealed a new family tree and threw in a surprise twist. Dire wolves have their own separate lineage. They aren't in the same family tree as African jackals, grey wolves, coyotes and dogs. In fact, they branched off nearly six million years ago. So now, instead of sticking them with the usual wolf gang, Canis genus, researchers want to put them in their own larger family with foxes, jackals, and other dog-like creatures. The proposed classification for dire wolves is Enosion dirus, and that's a designation which was first suggested all the way back in 1918. The collagen of La Brea dire wolf was also analyzed, and it was found that it backed up the idea of a species split. Hence, experts on ancient canids are giving the green light to this reclassification based on the genetic info. This shakeup certainly changes how we picture dire wolves. Forget the usual big, 
gray, fierce timber wolf look. Living in the warmer spots of North America, dire wolves might have rocked features more common in warm climates, like red fur, a bushy tail, and rounder ears. Think of a giant reddish coyote. When I say giant, I really want you to think big, because while a coyote weighs around 20 kilograms, the dire wolf starts at 60 kilograms. It also has some seriously unique and kinda terrifying features that made it stand out, especially when compared to the gray wolf. One of its most recognizable traits was, again, its size. Paleontologists have crunched the numbers and figured that an average adult dire wolf weighed between 60 kilograms, 132 pounds, to 68 kilograms, 150 pounds. That's already on par with the biggest gray wolves. But hey, some individuals went even bigger. Now, we don't know the exact size of these mega wolves, but paleontologists throw around a theoretical maximum of 110 kilograms, 243 pounds, for the absolute giants. Anything beyond that is a no-go, thanks to some skeletal restrictions. Even without going into the theoretical realm, the confirmed sizes still make the dire wolf one of the largest canines to ever roam the earth. And if it were a wolf, it would easily take the crown as the biggest canis species ever. Speaking of size, I gotta tell you, the size difference between male and female dire wolves was pretty minimal, especially when it came to their bone and teeth structure. Surprisingly, there wasn't much of that stereotypical dimorphism, where the ladies have more feminine traits. Nope, both male and female dire wolves rocked similar teeth size and bone structure. Now, in today's animal kingdom, the extent of the size difference usually hints at the breeding system. If males have giant canine teeth, it's often a sign of intense competition for females, and the system might be polygamous. One big shot male dominating and mating with multiple females. But with dire wolves, where both sexes had almost identical canine teeth, it's a different story. This suggests there wasn't much competition between the guys, and the researchers are leaning towards a more pair-bonded setup. In simpler terms, it's believed that dire wolf packs were likely monogamous, with one male cozying up to one female for some wolfy romance. Now, what did they like to eat? Turns out these guys were big meatheads, with about 70% of their food coming from meat, wild horses and bison, with the occasional fancy feast featuring mastodon, and giant ground sloths were their absolute fave. However, they didn't really like smaller snacks. That's probably because the rear teeth of dire wolves were built for tearing, not chewing. So, it seems like they didn't get to savor the flavors through a good chew. Instead, these guys were more into tearing off hefty chunks of flesh and gulping it down in one go. Now, this dining preference might have played a role in their eventual extinction. The thinking goes that being picky eaters, especially in a changing environment, could have put dire wolves at a disadvantage. As their large prey, like the wild horses and bison, faced challenges or changes in their habitats, dire wolves might not have easily adapted to a new menu. However, surprisingly, they'd also crave some sweet treats sometimes, which drew them to fruits like berries. Yeah, I know, they don't really look like the type to eat berries. What's known about their living preferences is that these beasts definitely lived in packs, and this is a common belief, especially because many sites across the Americas have turned up loads of dire wolf remains, all lying together. One of the most famous spots for this ancient wolf party is, of course, the La Brea Tar Pits. And the crazy thing is, there are so many dire wolf fossils found there that it's pretty convincing. These wolves were into group living, for sure. However, we don't know exactly how big these wolf packs were. Estimates suggest they could range anywhere from 12 to 30 individuals. Man, that's a lot of wolves. But you know that their pack structure is exactly what made them super successful, because together they were a challenge for other predators. And fossil remains tell us that dire wolves were indeed the real kings of the carnivores back in their time. The pack had a power duo, two alphas leading the way, and the rest of the gang were the offspring of these alpha pairs from both the current and previous years. Now, dire wolves shared their turf with a bunch of other predators, like the Smilodon, American Lion, Short-Faced Bear, and Modern Cougars. This crowded predator scene meant fierce competition for food, and studies on the bones of the dire wolf's prey revealed that these wolves were no dainty eaters. They went all in, chomping down as much as possible, 
as quickly as possible, which was clearly a survival strategy given their environment. Moreover, humans might have been a bit of a headache for these big canines too. After all, both humans and direwolves shared North America for thousands of years, with humans arriving over 20,000 years ago and direwolves sticking around until about 9,500 years ago. Now let's talk about their sudden disappearing act. Scientists are still in the dark about exactly why direwolves ghosted on us. But here's what we do know. They vanished along with other big Ice Age animals. There's one pretty famous theory though. Yep, you know it. They blame it on climate change. Perhaps the big prey that direwolves chowed down on kicked the bucket due to the changing climate. Meanwhile, grey wolves and coyotes survived because they could switch to smaller snacks. However, this theory is turning out to be a bit flawed, because if anything, the dire wolf is seen as better equipped to survive than the grey wolf. So now, we have another possibility that perhaps this beast had a completely different social structure compared to grey wolves. That could have been what really led to its extinction, instead of shortage of prey. And of course, humans might have played a part. Early Native Americans could have been competing with dire wolves for their prey, leading to tough times for these ancient predators. In the end, these North American giants, 20% larger than today's grey wolves, are considered one of the most famous species of prehistoric carnivores to ever exist. Their dominance, notably in the La Brea tar pits, challenges existing perceptions of the Pleistocene carnivore hierarchies. Even though it's gone extinct, this magnificent animal will continue to live on in our imaginations when we reminisce on the Ice Age. With enormous, deadly sharp canines, this saber-toothed cat is well known as one of the most powerful animals to ever go extinct. But what exactly did it do with those seven-inch long fangs coming out of its jaw? Was it an isolated predator or did it live in prides like modern lions? We've got all the answers for you. But first, we must warn you. While Smilodon is related to today's cats, it was sadly nothing like your typical house kitty. So don't be fooled by its furry appearance, cause there was nothing cuddly about it. The name literally means deadly knife tooth, but you'll be shocked as we reveal the real purpose behind those finely serrated fangs. Now, the Smilodon's often compared to a modern lion in size, but its build was actually very different. These cats were hugely powerful and muscular beyond comparison. They had three different species. Smilodon gracilis or esfragilis was the smaller one, living from 2.5 to 0.5 million years ago. Smilodon populata, found in eastern South America, was a bigger cat, living from 1 million years to 10,000 years ago. It was hefty, measuring 3 meters in length and standing at 1.25 meters tall. It weighed between 220 to 400 kilograms, making it one of the heaviest cats ever. Its upper canines were incredibly long, reaching up to 28 centimeters. The third and the final species was Smilodon fatalis, or S. californicus, and it was famous for being found in the Rancho La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. This cat was similar in size to a female lion, but heavier, weighing about 200 kilograms and standing around one meter tall at the shoulders. It lived from 1.6 million years to 10,000 years ago. Now, many Smilodon bones have been found in California, but these big cats roamed freely throughout both North and South America during the Ice Age. Other Ice Age carnivores, like the short-faced bear and direwolf, are closely related to modern bears and wolves, but no true descendants or relatives of the saber-toothed cats survive today. If we talk about its appearance, Smilodon was about the size of a lion, but wouldn't have looked like one. Its body proportions and likely its gait and behavior would have been more similar to a black bear than to a lion. It had massive arms and forearms, a huge chest, relatively short and stout back legs, and grappling hooks on its thumbs. The neck muscles were also much larger than those of modern cats, implying that Smilodon had a pretty powerful bite. Out of the three species, Smilodon populata was the largest saber-toothed tiger measuring about 3 meters in length, standing 1.25 meters tall, and weighing about 400 kilograms. That is to say, it was a bit larger than a modern-day lion, and much heavier. It had short, muscular legs, and a bobtail similar to a modern bobcat. 
This ferocious cat's powerful front legs were adapted for springing onto prey, but it wasn't very fast and couldn't chase down swift animals like deer. But you'll be shocked to find out what it was capable of hunting. Its skull was 31 centimeters long and had two huge saber-like canine teeth that were serrated and oval in cross-section. Remember Diego from the movie Ice Age? Yes, just like him. Many Smilodon fossils have been found with broken canines, indicating tough encounters during hunts. For instance, a fossil wolf was found with a Smilodon tooth fragment embedded in its skull. Another Smilodon recovered from the La Brea tar pits had a fatal puncture wound from another of its own kind, suggesting they might have engaged in fierce fights. Scientists can also calculate Smilodon's build from fossils, but it's much harder to determine what its skin and fur would have looked like based on modern cats. Their coats could have had various markings designed for optimal hunting camouflage. While they probably didn't have stripes like tigers, if they had any patterns on their fur, they were more likely spots. That's because the environment at Rancho La Brea, where many Smilodon fossils were found, wouldn't have been suitable for striped camouflage. Next, let us introduce you to this cat's insanely flexible jaw. Seriously, you'll be surprised how far these cats could open their jaws. They had the impressive ability to open them up to a whopping 120 degrees, which is far more than today's lions, as they can only manage about 65 degrees. On top of this crazy flexibility, Smilodon's strong neck and jaw muscles enabled them to stab its prey with its deadly maxillary canine saber teeth. However, its jaws were relatively weak due to its long canines, and that resulted in a bite strength comparable to that of a large dog and much weaker than that of a lion. It may have used its front incisor teeth to tear strips of flesh from the bones of its prey. Their massive teeth are often compared to a stag's antlers, suggesting they were specialized for killing. Honestly, it's hard to imagine these large canines having any other purpose than piercing thick-skinned prey. Smilodon fatalis was one of the many saber-toothed predators that once ruled the planet. While today's big cats don't have saber teeth, these specialized features have come and gone in ancient mammals several times. It is believed that these long teeth evolved to help the cat hunt tough-skinned prey. DNA analysis of Homeotherium, a cousin of Smilodon, showed it mainly hunted mammoths. This suggests saber-toothed features evolved multiple times to tackle thick-skinned prey. With canines twice as long as homotheriums and a strong body, Smilodon might have specialized in hunting not just young mammoths, but adults too. Research also suggests that Smilodon could shear off flesh from kills using its carnassial teeth. But it's unclear if these cats could survive after losing their teeth. The common belief is that they'd probably die. There's another pretty interesting fact about their teeth. Smilodon cubs have been found in the La Brea tar pits, and analysis of their teeth revealed they were born with serrated milk sabers, just like hyenas. These specialized teeth likely helped them eat portions of a carcass that adults couldn't. It took about three years for Smilodon cubs to reach full maturity, with their adult sabers growing in around one and a half years of age. It's been revealed that their teeth grew at a rate approximately double that of their living relatives, but still took years to fully emerge. This study introduced a new technique combining isotopic analysis and X-ray imaging, which for the first time provides specific ages for developmental events in Smilodon, particularly in their teeth. The research estimates that the permanent upper canines of S. Fatalis erupted at a rate of 6 mm per month, twice as fast as the growth rate of an African lion's teeth. However, the dagger-like canines of the extinct cat weren't fully developed until about three years of age. Now this is pretty darn important for predators like big cats, because for these guys, an important factor determining an individual's full hunting ability is the time it takes for their weapons, which are their teeth, to grow. Now for the real use of these teeth. What good were they? The saber-toothed cat was particularly known for its ability to take down large prey. Its iconic massive canines, the largest of any mammal, were impressive weapons. But scientists have long debated how these teeth were actually used. A new study on Smilodon suggests that despite their size, their bite was surprisingly weak. So, instead of being used for overpowering prey, these teeth were likely precision weapons, 
they would deliver a single, final wound to a subdued victim, similar to an assassin's stiletto, rather than a swordman's blade, if you know what I mean. Before the study, people had different ideas about how Smilodon hunted. Some thought it used its teeth to hang onto big prey, slash them open, or impale them when jumping. One idea was that it aimed for the throat for a quick kill, unlike modern lions that suffocate their prey. But to really understand how this cat liked to kill, we have to know how strong its bite was. That's what would really settle the debate about its hunting techniques. So paleontologists started by studying Smilodon's fossilized skull. But even then, opinions varied depending on which part of the skull they focused on. Some thought it had small jaw muscles, while others believed its bite could have been powered from the neck. The lower jaw appeared smaller but strongly built, which supported the idea of a powerful bite. In order to get clearer answers, Colin McHenry and his team from the University of Newcastle, Australia, decided to digitally test Smilodon's skull. They used a technique called finite element analysis, which is often used in mechanical engineering and car crash testing. Using CT scans, they made detailed 3D models of Smilodon and a lion's skulls. Because both predators weighed about the same, they probably hunted similar sized prey. So, they simulated the jaw and neck muscles of both animals and tested their bites on a computer. The results showed that the lion had a much stronger bite than Smilodon in almost every aspect. While the lion could chomp down with a force of over 3,000 newtons or 300 kilograms, Smilodon managed only around 1,000 newtons. Its jaws were surprisingly underpowered for its size, biting with about the same force as a smaller jaguar or even a dog. But Factoring in the powerful neck muscles, Smilodon's bite force increased to a more respectable 2,000 newtons. This tells you that it likely bit from the neck rather than the jaw. Now, even though this helped the Smilodon get a bit of an upgrade in its reputation, it turns out it wasn't much of a runner when it came to biting prey. Unlike lions, which can grab onto fast-moving buffalo without a hitch thanks to their strong skulls, Smilodon would have been in big trouble if it tried the same trick. Even with a good 200 kilograms of force pushing sideways on its teeth, Smilodon's teeth and skull would have been really strained. Trying to tackle big prey that were still moving would have been risky business, possibly leading to broken teeth or a busted skull. This not-so-powerful bite of the saber-toothed cat means a lot of the ideas about how it hunted are off the table. It couldn't chase after running prey, and if it tried to slash at the belly, it might have ended up with broken teeth if the prey fought back. Smilodon's best bet was to use its teeth to finish off prey that was already caught and couldn't move. It was a one-shot deal, saved for taking down prey that had already been tackled and pinned, preferably at the head. Thankfully, the rest of Smilodon's body was perfectly suited for this kind of hunting. Its build was more like a bear than a cat and it had extra-large dew claws on its thumbs. These features would have provided enough strength and force to take down large animals in a way that today's lions just can't manage. Lions typically take down prey with a prolonged suffocating bite that can last for as long as 13 minutes. But for Smilodon, once its saber teeth pierced the carotid artery, the fate of its prey would have been sealed in just seconds. Now, which poor animals ended up on the receiving end of these hellish teeth? Well, by now you probably know that Smilodons were carnivores. Of course, their big, unique canines are the biggest clue to this. Given the size of their teeth and their strong skeletons, they definitely hunted large mammals such as bison, horses, camels, giant ground sloths, and possibly mammoths and mastodonts. Many scientists think Smilodons were ambush predators they had strong, muscular front legs, which suggests they might have pounced on their prey suddenly and killed them quickly. After tackling its prey with its powerful front legs, Smilodon would use its strong neck muscles to drive its saber teeth into either the neck or belly of its victim. But there's debate among scientists about which area it targeted. Some scientists argue that targeting the belly is risky as it leaves the cat vulnerable to a counterattack, such as a kick from the prey. Additionally, stomach bites with saber teeth typically only cause shallow wounds. On the other hand, a bite to the throat can swiftly paralyze the prey by severing important blood vessels and the trachea, 
while also controlling its movement. So, Smilodon's large canines were likely adapted for making quick kills compared to modern cats. These powerful weapons allowed it to dispatch its prey swiftly and consume its meal without worrying about other predators stealing it. But where was it spotting and hunting all this big prey? Well, luckily for this cat, North America was teeming with large herbivores during the Pleistocene. This provided a massive food supply to hungry prehistoric predators like Smilodon. These cats liked to live in warm climates and inhabited various regions across the American continents. As mentioned earlier, an analysis of isotopes tells us that Smilodon mainly preyed upon undulates like camels, horses, and bison, but it also included armored Glyptotherium in its diet. These big cats preferred areas with dense vegetation, likely living in forested habitats. In South America, Smilodon also hunted animals such as Macrochenia, Toxodon, and horses. However, they faced tough competition from other predators like dire wolves, American lions, jaguars, homotherium, and short-faced bears, which shared their range on both continents. Now, Smilodon evolved and primarily inhabited North America. So when North and South America connected during the Pliocene and formed a land bridge, Smilodon became part of the Great American Exchange. While it's often thought to be the main reason for the extinction of animals like Thylocosmilus, and the forest hassid terror birds, this isn't accurate. In fact, Smilodon gracilis lived alongside the forest rassid titanus and Thylocosmilus. And Thylocosmilus went extinct about 4 million years before Smilodon evolved. Now the question is, how did these cats live? Did they live in prides like lions or did they form packs like wolves? Well, Smilodon evolved to target the biggest of animals in its environment. This meant brute force and killing power might not have been enough. A new kind of killing strategy was required. Bison, horses, camels, giant ground sloths, and mammoths were potential prey. But unless Smilodon hunted together, these giants were formidable opponents. Now, most modern big cats, like tigers, are solitary and hunt alone. Only lions, which live in prides, collaborate to take down very big animals. While there's no definitive proof that saber-toothed cats hunted in packs, clues can be found in the bones at the La Brea Tar Pits. Fossil remains of 2,500 individual saber-toothed cats have been excavated there, outnumbering prey almost 10 to 1. Often, several saber-toothed cat skeletons are found with a single large herbivore's bones, suggesting they were social animals. Some scientists do believe Smilodon lived in social groups, like modern lions, a lion pride typically consists of females living with males, with females doing most of the hunting. Group living provides advantages such as hunting larger game and feeding injured members. And we also have evidence from Smilodon remains at La Brea suggesting these cats could survive severe injuries with the help of their group members. But not everyone agrees with this theory. Some argue that social interaction is rare among carnivores and it's more likely that injured members would be eaten rather than nursed back to health. Which brings us to our next theory that Smilodon may have lived more like modern wolves with monogamous pairs lasting a long time. This is because unlike lions, both male and female Smilodons were similar in size and had the same formidable teeth. This points to the fact that maybe they didn't have distinct roles like those seen in lion prides Finding similar giant canines in both sexes also rules out the idea of these teeth being male ornaments. Now, let's dig into the story of how people first found out about Smilodon. In 1830, a Danish scientist named Peter Wilhelm Lund found and described the first Smilodon populator fossil in Brazil. He called this group of animals Smilodon in 1842. After this first discovery, other similar cats were found too. In 1869, another kind called Smilodon fatalis was dug up in North America by a scientist named Joseph Lady. Then, in 1880, yet another type called Smilodon gracilis was discovered by a scientist named Edward Drinker Cope. It was discovered that these big cats lived pretty long ago and were found in different parts of the world like Eurasia, North America, and South America. Out of these three, Smilodon fatalis is the one most people know about in North America. 
Lots of them were found in a place called Rancho La Brea in California, where there are sticky pits of tar. Scientists used the bones of these animals to figure out how they are related to the animals we see today. But because the bones are so old, there's not a lot of information scientists could get from them. So, it was assumed that these cats, like all big and small cats, belong to the family called Felidae and the group called Carnivora. An early analysis of the DNA of these creatures suggested they were closely related to modern-day cats, like lions and tigers. But recent, more detailed research showed that Smilodons weren't actually close relatives of these cats. Instead, they belong to a group called Macheridontinae, which is pretty different from the group that modern cats belong to. Now, that's all good, but then how exactly did these cats get wiped off the planet? Saber-toothed cats disappeared along with other big animals about 12,000 years back, during a time called the Quaternary Extinction. Some say it was because of climate changes or humans hunting them down. Old studies, especially looking at teeth from the La Brea tar pits, made people think these cats had a tough time finding food. They saw lots of broken teeth and figured the cats were biting into bones out of desperation. But a fresh look at the evidence tells a different story. Researchers now suggest something else. Instead of struggling to find food, the saber-toothed cats might have been pretty skilled at hunting big prey, like mammoths and giant sloths. Their big bodies and huge teeth probably helped with this hunting style. Surprisingly, despite their fierce look, their teeth were actually quite fragile compared to smaller predators. This means their broken teeth might have come from hunting, not from chewing bones. These new findings change how we understand these ancient hunters. It tells us that their extinction might not have been just because they couldn't find enough food. Further research on other big predators from the same time will likely give us more clues about why these ferocious cats disappeared. In the end, Smilodon, with its massive size, seven inches long canines, and unique hunting adaptations, stood as a formidable predator of the late Pleistocene era. Despite its eventual extinction, this big cat's legacy lives on through the countless fossils that have been discovered. If you want to check one out, hit up the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a peek. If we roll the clock back 13,000 years and you find yourself in a face-off with this formidable beast, good night. The American lion was a giant pantherian cat that roamed the lands of North America during the Pleistocene epoch. The species earned its scientific name, Panthera atrox, with the Latin word atrox meaning savage or cruel. And believe me when I say that name perfectly portrays its scary, predatory nature. These powerful cats can grow to twice the height of a person, and some can even weigh as much as a full-grown brown bear. You know what that makes them, the second largest land predator. Besides their size, lions are admired for their elegance and cleverness, which have helped them thrive in the open grasslands. And yet, none of them compare to how intelligent and majestic the American lion was. It was not only bigger than today's lions, but also the largest feline predator ever known to exist. Now, here's what I mean when I call it majestic. It measured up to 2.5 meters, 8 feet, 2 inches, from nose to tail base, and stood around 1.2 meters, 3.9 feet tall at the shoulder. But you're not ready for this next detail. They could stretch up to 12 feet tall on their hind legs. Man, that is massive. It's around the same size as an African elephant. However, just like their African relatives, these lions showed some big differences between males and females. The males were heavyweights, weighing around 523 kilograms, 1,153 pounds, and to put it into perspective, that means they could outweigh eight adult humans. The ladies were a bit lighter though, weighing about 365 kilograms, 805 pounds, not exactly your average kittens. Now, let's talk bones. The American lion had some seriously sturdy limb bones, beefier even than those of African lions, more like what you'd find in a brown bear. Thanks to a bunch of fossils that were discovered at the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, scientists have gotten a good handle on what these lions were all about. They were kind of like modern lions, but bigger. Sort of like their cousins, the Eurasian cave lions, and the Natodomeri lion from back in the day in Eastern Africa. 
Some skin remains have also been found in caves down in the Argentine Patagonia, suggesting that the American lion had a reddish coat, and cave paintings found in the Santa Cruz province of Argentina back that up. They actually show the lion with a similar reddish color. This helps tell them apart from other big predators like jaguars, which were painted with more of a yellowish hue in similar cave art. But just like the dire wolf, it turns out that the American lion wasn't actually a lion. Recent research has revealed that despite many similarities, these two cats are too different to belong to the same species. The American lion had a sturdy build, lacked a developed mane, had proportionally longer legs, and a uniquely shaped skull. While it still fell under the Panthera genus, its scientific name became Panthera atrox, acknowledging its ferocious demeanor and size. Some studies even questioned its closest relative, suggesting it might be the tiger or jaguar. However, DNA sequencing confirmed that the lion is indeed its closest kin. We'll dive deeper into this later on in the video. As for now, there's one question that comes to mind. Why was it so big? Well, somewhere along the way, the American lion not only became its own distinct species, but also grew astonishingly large. Paleontologists estimate that, on average, an adult American lion was about 25% larger than an African lion, but some individuals surpassed even this size. This considerable size difference was due to high sexual dimorphism and variability in size within the species. In fact, some exceptionally large specimens discovered in 2012 suggest that American lions could reach sizes surpassing even their closest rivals, the Smilodon and Panthera fossils. While their impressive size made them one of the most formidable predators of their time, I gotta tell you, it didn't slow them down at all. Yep, despite their mammoth bodies, they were surprisingly fast. Their sturdy bones and long legs enabled them to maintain speeds of over 30 miles per hour, 48 kilometers, which is faster than any human runner and comparable to a warthog speed. Now you're probably thinking, this agility must have made them insanely good hunters. Well, they did pose a threat to all those who shared their habitat, but they didn't exactly play the cat and mouse game. The truth is, despite their speed, it's believed that the American lion primarily hunted using ambush tactics rather than chasing prey over long distances. During these ambushes, they would use their retractable claws and powerful bite to take down unsuspecting targets. This method is supported by evidence from recovered specimens, such as Blue Babe, a frozen steppe bison, which show deep claw wounds and bite marks matching those of an American lion. So it's settled. These ambush predators relied on surprise and precision to capture their prey effectively. Now, what happened to the prey once it got captured? Well, this is where the bite force of the American lion comes into play. It's anyone's guess that it was particularly fierce thanks to its exceptionally powerful jaws. Also, its thickly built skull allowed it to sink its 4-inch, 10-centimeter long canines into prey with a force of 1,800 pounds per square inch. This made its bite nearly three times more powerful than that of a modern lion and six times stronger than that of a Smilodon, which had relatively weaker bite force due to its saber teeth. With all of this amazing strength, the American lion could easily immobilize and subdue its prey. Like other modern cats, this one also had conical-shaped teeth. Its upper canines were round and formed a slightly curved cone when seen from the side. They fit neatly behind the lower canines, rather than sticking out of its closed mouth. And hey, those teeth were exclusively used for consuming meat. Male American lions had canines that were about 20% larger than those of females, and the power of their bite was mainly focused at these larger canines. The now extinct American lion also appears to have been quite intelligent. We know this because of its large brain case and the fact that many living species of Panthera are pretty famous for their intelligence. On top of that, evidence of its intellect can be indirectly observed through ancient tar traps found throughout the United States. These traps ensnared herbivores for thousands of years during the Pleistocene era, serving as a learning tool for predators. Interestingly, despite being one of the most common carnivores of its time, the American lion was rarely found in these traps. In contrast, competing predators like the dire wolf and Smilodon were pretty abundant in these areas. This leads paleontologists to believe that the American lion 
had heightened intelligence, which must have allowed it to better avoid such traps. In addition to its intelligence, the American lion is believed to have possessed other useful traits shared with its modern relatives, including remarkable vision, smell, and hearing. Paleontologists suggest that its hearing was acute enough to detect sounds coming from well over a mile, 1.6 kilometers away, and its sense of smell may have been even more impressive. It's believed that it could probably detect the scent of prey from multiple miles or kilometers away. These heightened senses obviously made locating prey and navigating its environment a piece of cake for this beast. But then again, it's never really that easy in the jungle, is it? So, what kind of prey did it go after? With its impressive traits and massive size, the American lion was capable of hunting a wide range of prey. Its known targets include deer, horses, camels, tapirs, peccaries, rodents, and steppe bison. Among these, the steppe bison appears to have been a favorite on the menu. We know this through evidence of multiple American lion attacks on them, documented through various specimens. This diverse diet clearly shows the American lion's adaptability and effectiveness as a hunter in its ancient ecosystem. It also had a knack for hunting particularly young, large megafauna, and this liking extended to other herbivores too, like the American mastodon. Paleontologists believe that along with competitors such as wolves, dire wolves, and saber-toothed cats, the American lion posed a serious threat to megafauna populations. In fact, these predators were responsible for up to 17% of all deaths among juvenile megafauna. Their success in hunting these young individuals likely had significant impacts on the dynamics and survival of megafauna populations during that time. It may have also preyed on the giant Colombian mammoth that lived alongside it. However, it's unclear whether it targeted adults or just sub-adults. This depended on whether it lived in prides or not. Currently, there's no conclusive evidence suggesting it lived in prides. Some argue its large size implies it was a lone hunter, while others believe its nearest living relative, which lives in prides, suggests it did too. If it did live in prides, it would have had a decent chance of bringing down mature mammoths. But even if it was a solitary creature, it still posed a threat to mammoth populations. According to one study, young mammoths experienced a stage where they were small enough for American lions to take down yet mature enough to wander away from their mothers to forage. Hence, paleontologists believe many mammoths fell victim to American lions during the stage between two and nine years old, when they would have weighed a maximum of two tons. But then again, this window of opportunity for felines was crucial for their survival and hunting success. Now, the American lion's hunting range and habitat were very vast. That was the case because it could easily adapt to various environments, in fact, no other mammal, except for humans, has had such a wide geographical distribution as the extinct lions in the Panthera lineage. It inhabited most of the United States, parts of Canada and Mexico during the Middle and Late Pleistocene periods, with its oldest fossils dating back 340,000 years. Interestingly, it seemed to prefer expansive plains and savannas, avoiding dense forests found in eastern Canada and northeastern United States. These plains and savannas often experienced harsh cold weather, especially during the last glacial maximum between 20,000 to 26,000 years ago. It's believed that the American lions sought shelter in caves during these cold spells and may have lined their dens with grass and leaves. This is a behavior similar to that of the living Siberian tiger, and this adaptability to diverse environments contributed to the American lion's success as a hunter and survivor in its time. Despite the chilly environment it inhabited, the habitat of the American lion teemed with life. It coexisted alongside many iconic Ice Age animals, including mammoths, mastodons, cougars, coyotes, black bears, jaguars, short-faced bears, pronghorns, wood bison, longhorn bison, ground sloths, giant beavers, moose, mountain goats, voles, and even glyptodon. Yeah, I think that's enough names before you start to doze off. Anyway, this diverse ecosystem shaped the interactions and survival strategies of the formidable American lion. Moreover, since it was still around 20,000 years ago, it coexisted with humans too, and they may have been one of its primary threats. This idea comes from the discovery of trash heaps containing American lion bones, found alongside Paleolithic human artifacts. 
this finding has led some to believe that humans were a contributing factor in the American lion's eventual extinction. But this most likely went both ways, because it's believed that it delayed the migration of human beings across the Bering Sea, because it hunted us. Some really well-preserved specimens of the American lion also revealed insights into its fur. Apparently, it had two distinct layers of fur, an outer layer made of guard hairs and a dense undercoat. This dual-layered fur not only provided protection from the cold, but also gave the American lion a reddish appearance that we mentioned earlier. Now, the DNA data extracted from fossil remains is a pretty solid indicator of the American lion's family tree. It turns out that this magnificent beast is closely related to its Eurasian cousin, the cave lion. The story goes back about 340,000 years ago, when a group of cave lions found themselves stranded south of the North American ice sheet, likely due to geographical isolation. According to estimates, the common ancestor of the American lion lineage lived around 200,000 years ago, suggesting that it split off from the cave lion before the Illinoisan glaciation period kicked in. While the cave lion population made its way to eastern Beringia, the American lion remained separate. This way, it maintained its genetic identity throughout various climate shifts, including the Illinoisan and Wisconsin glaciations, as well as the Sangamoan interglacial periods. Interestingly, during the warmer periods, dense boreal forests might have acted as barriers, further isolating the American lion population. Alternatively, there might have been reproductive barriers that prevented interbreeding between the two lion populations. The study also reveals that the modern lion is the closest living relative of both the American lion and the cave lion. Initially, it was thought that the lineages leading to the modern lion and the American slash cave lions diverged around 1.9 million years ago. However, recent genomic research has pinpointed a more specific timeline. It suggests that the lineage of the cave lion split from that of the modern lion around 392,000 to 529,000 years ago. But if you're thinking the American lion may have also had something to do with the more recently extinct Barbary lion, I hate to break it to you, but you're wrong. However, if you'd like to learn more about that completely separate but equally fierce species of lions, you can check out this video of ours. But I gotta warn you, there's a lot of bombshells waiting for you in it. The American lion's existence was first discovered by paleontologists in the early 1800s when parts of its skull were found in Mississippi. A chap named William Henry Huntington was just rummaging around the ravines when he stumbled upon something, well, kinda creepy if you really think about it. It was a jawbone with a few teeth. But this wasn't just any jawbone. It belonged to what we now know as Panthera atrox, or the American lion. Being the curious soul he was, Huntington wasted no time and shared his discovery with the esteemed American Philosophical Society. Later, he stowed away this precious find in the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. But, as is often the case with remarkable discoveries, it took a while for this one to receive its due recognition. It wasn't until 1853 that a certain Joseph Lady stepped up to the plate and officially christened this partial jawbone as Felis Atrox, which translates to Savage Cat. Lady even went a step further and named another similar species in 1873. However, it turned out that this other species was merely a synonym for our American lion, Panthera atrox. Then in 1907, a couple of guys in Alaska stumbled upon a large number of Panthera atrox skulls, and down in sunny California, in the famed Rancho La Brea, a sizable felid skull was unearthed. The early to mid-1900s saw a flurry of activity in La Brea, with numerous fossils surfacing, offering us a comprehensive glimpse into the world of Panthera atrox. Initially, it was thought to be a new species within the Felis genus, which includes domestic cats. However, as more specimens were found, it became clear that it was more similar to larger cats. It was then reclassified into the Panthera genus, which includes lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and snow leopards. As the decades rolled on, more fossils emerged, stretching the geographical range of Panthera atrox from the sunny climate of Mexico all the way up to the chilly land of Canada. Then, in 2009, a momentous discovery was made, a place called Natural Trap Cave in Wyoming. It turned out to be a veritable gold mine for Panthera atrox fossils, ranking as the second most prolific site. And here's the amazing part. 
nestled within these fossil remains was well-preserved DNA, providing researchers with an invaluable window into the past and shedding new light on the lives of these ancient beasts. At first, scientists thought the American lion deserved its own spot in the Pantherinae family. They even gave it a fierce name, Panthera atrox, which basically means terrifying panther in Latin. Some experts were on board with this idea, while others thought it was just a variation of the regular lion we know today, or maybe a close relative of the ancient Eurasian cave lion. But then things got a bit confusing. Instead of being its own species, the American lion got reclassified as a type of lion, specifically a subspecies of the regular lion. However, opinions about its status have gone back and forth over time. When scientists tried to figure out where it fits in the family tree using physical features, it was like trying to solve a puzzle with missing pieces. One study thought the American lion and the cave lion were best buddies with the tiger. They pointed to similarities in their skulls, especially in the part that holds the brain. Another study thought that they were more likely distant relatives of modern leopards and lions. But a recent study took a closer look at the American lion's skull and jaws compared to other big cats. And well, they didn't quite match up with lions. They suggested it might be its own unique thing, separate from lions, but related to jaguars. Another study, though, disagreed, and according to it, it's definitely more lion-like, and any similarity it shares with jaguars are just coincidental. Now, if you're wondering who'd win in a one-on-one -on -one between Smilodon Populator and an American lion, it's likely the American lion would snag the win. And here's why. First off, size matters. Both cats stand about the same height at the shoulder, but the lion is heavier and longer. Then, when it comes to chomping down, the lion takes the cake with a stronger bite. While people often think Smilodon had a monstrous bite, it's actually the lion that reigns supreme in that department. Then there's agility. The lion wins again with its sleek cat-like build and long tail, making it more nimble. Smilodon, with its bear-like body and stubby tail, likely couldn't match the lion's agility at all. And hey, speed, no contest. Smilodon was built for ambush hunting slow-moving prey, while the lion could catch faster game like deer. So yeah, in a fight, the lion's agility and speed give it an edge. But for the sake of being fair, let's not count Smilodon out completely. It had some pretty hefty paws, and its bulky build gave it raw power, though the lion wasn't exactly a lightweight either. Lastly, the lion's missing something, a mane. While modern lions sport that impressive hairdo for protection in fights, the American lion went au naturel, leaving its head and neck more exposed. So yeah, while this can be a close fight, the American lion has the best chance of winning it. What do you think? The exact timing of the American lion's extinction remains uncertain, but the youngest fossils of this giant feline have been dated to around 12,877 years ago. This extinction date coincides with a significant extinction event known as the Quaternary Extinction. The late Quaternary Megafauna Extinction was a massive extinction event that rocked ecosystems worldwide. Climate change and the arrival of modern humans have long been pointed to as the main culprits, but just how much each contributed to the devastation isn't very clear. But what we do know is that many of the large mammal species disappeared from the beginning of the last interglacial around 132,000 years ago up to just 1,000 years ago. And sadly, the extinct American lion was one of them. While extinctions are nothing new in Earth's history, the speed and scale of this event were unprecedented in millions of years. In the end, there's only one thing left to say. All cats are runners and killers, but the American lion the biggest cat of all time could do it all better. Be it humans, horses, or other megafauna, this cat's teeth could cut the jugular right out of them, and with its massive size and robust bone structure, it was for sure a dominant predator of its time and ruled over every landscape that it inhabited. And that's a wrap. But here's a question for you. If you got lost in an Alaskan national park and got chased by a predator, do you think your chances of surviving would be greater if it was a Smilodon or an American lion? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.